Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I am the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana. If you'd like to stop by and visit us, you can find us at 5600 Van Road. You can also get in touch with us by phone or email, 812-550-6234, or info at riverridgechurch.org, and we would love to hear from you. Love to take any questions that you might have, whether it's about our congregation or something for me to address on this program. First and Second Kings. These fit into the genre of history. There are quite a few books like that in the Old Testament. And of course, it's not just uh, a history book. It's a history book through the lens of God's people uh, and the, the plan that God was implementing for all of mankind for our redemption. But nevertheless, it's history. And so I think it's a good idea for us to consider for a moment before we dig into it, what is the purpose of history? It's not just about knowing what happened. It's about understanding how we got where we are today. And then further, understanding how to handle where we are today. But as I said, this is more than just any old history book. This is the history of God's people. And that being the case, you might expect a long list of righteous victories and instances of uh, God's people weathering persecution, seeing a dogged insistence on maintaining their ancient religion, perhaps occasional stumbles and conflicts, but learning and growing, always hug it out in the end and move forward into bigger and better things. And that's not what we end up seeing in First and Second Kings. Kings is, in a way, the story of the struggle over the soul of the nation. And by the end of it, it would appear that God lost the fight. Now that's not really what happened. God knew what was going to happen all along. He knew that uh, these two kingdoms were going to reject him. And he never really intended for them to be the kingdom of God in its final form. In Kings, we do see some righteous individuals and we're supposed to root for them along the way, but most of the time we'll be left shaking our heads in disappointment as the Israelites, who should be our team, so to speak, fumble and stumble over and over and over again. Kings is divided into two portions, first and second Kings, but the division is pretty much meaningless. Instead, let me outline the book for you in a more coherent fashion. 1 Kings chapters 1 through 11 are about Solomon's reign. 1 Kings chapters 12 through 14 are about the fracturing of the kingdom and the first two kings in the divided monarchy. And then 1 Kings 15 through 2 Kings 25 are summaries of each king's reign and the tenures of two major prophets as well. Now, within that first section on Solomon, the first four chapters of 1 Kings are about the transition from David's leadership to Solomon's and then Solomon's early reign. Chapters 5 through 9 are about Solomon's building of the temple. Chapters 10 and 11 are about Solomon's later reign and his moral decline. That second section is too short to really bother breaking it up. And then there's the third section, which... Well, it can't be broken up as neatly as the first one with Solomon and the various portions of his reign... But in the long line of so-and-so died and was buried and his son reigned in his place, there are two other major characters who outlived multiple kings and maintained a major public profile throughout. Elijah and his successor, Elisha. Elijah bursts onto the scene out of nowhere in 1 Kings 17, and he's basically the main character until 2 Kings 2, when God takes Elijah to heaven, sidestepping the normal pattern of death, he has some things in common with Moses, but that's a story for another day, I suppose. At that point, in 2 Kings 2, the latter part of chapter 2, Elisha becomes effectively the main character of 2 Kings. And that continues through, or into at least, chapter 8, at which point we end up back with the so-and-so died and was buried and his son reigned in his place. One more note about the third section before we look at some examples from each. After Solomon's death, the, the kingdom of Israel had split into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Israel strayed from God farther and faster, and then David's line continued through the kings of Judah. And also the temple was in Jerusalem in the south, and at no point throughout the divided kingdom was the nation of Israel as a unit fully back in God's good graces. And so you might expect that the focus would be on Judah 
And yet it's not. The focus in Kings, at least, is on the northern kingdom of Israel instead. The politics of Judah are included in broad strokes, but most of the action takes place in the northern kingdom, up until Israel ceased to be a kingdom, at which point the focus shifts back over to Judah because, well, what else are you going to do with it? Now, Chronicles, on the other hand, which comes right after Kings in the canon, we'll get to that before too long in a separate show, and that talks a lot more about Judah. But in any case, I've taken you through the basic course, but we haven't actually read anything yet, and that's kind of important. So let's back up to section one and read a little bit about Solomon. First Kings chapter one, beginning in verse five. Now Adonijah, the son of Hekif, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him. His father had never at any time displeased him by saying, Why have you done thus and so? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. He conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar the priest, and they followed Adonijah and helped him. But Zadok the priest and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and Nathan the prophet and Shimei and Ray and David's mighty men were not with Adonijah. David is old, and his body and his mind are both going. And he's got a lot of sons. More than one of them want to be the next king. So Bathsheba went to the king in his chamber. Now the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite was attending to the king. Bathsheba bowed and paid homage to the king, and the king said, What do you desire? She said to him, My lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, saying, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. And now, behold, Adonijah is king, although you, my lord, the king, do not know it. He has sacrificed oxen, fattened cattle, and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king, Abiathar the priest, and Joab the commander of the army. But Solomon your servant he has not invited. And now, my lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Well, what's going to happen? Adonijah has the initiative, he has one of the two main priests, he has the chief military officer. Even if David wants to stop it, at this point, can he? Verse 29, And the king swore, saying, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. Even so will I do this day. Well, the problem is swiftly taken care of, so that there are two regnal ceremonies the same day in the same city. Awkward. So who's it going to be? Adonijah had a pretty compelling case. But Solomon has the actual king's decree, and God's prophet, and the other main priest, and the next most prestigious military chief, and the people. That pretty much settled it. David dies sometime shortly afterward, and Solomon begins his sole reign. And it starts out pretty well. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. Solomon's response is long-winded, so let's just cut to verses 9 through 14. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I will give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Chapters 5 through 9, as I said earlier, are about the temple. David had wanted to build a temple for God, but God told him no. He wanted Solomon to do it. David spent the rest of his life hoarding resources, and then Solomon put them to good use. There's a massive dedication ceremony in chapter 8, complete with the presence of God resting over the Ark of the Covenant. Let's read beginning of verse 10. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. 
seems great. So he has a long and prosperous reign, incredible revenues coming in, massive building projects, political dominance of the whole region, until chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had seven hundred wives who were princesses and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. For those who don't know, Molech is the idol predominantly worshipped through child sacrifice. How quickly things devolve into pagan barbarism. Not that abortion is any different today. Anywho, chapter 11, verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son." However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. This is exactly what happens over the next couple chapters. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is a bit of a dodo, and he has it in his head that he needs to one-up his father or risk losing his grasp on power. In reality, God had already ordained that he was going to lose his power anyway, but isn't it interesting how by refusing to accept what God has said, we often bring it about through our very attempts to avoid it? There's probably a lesson for us today in that. The kingdom ends up divided between Rehoboam in the south and Jeroboam in the north. Jeroboam was handpicked by God as Israel's king, a very competent man. So how'd he get along? Well, chapter 12, verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Then this thing became a sin, for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. Well, that seems like a fairly shrewd political move, and also a horribly bad idea. God doesn't like this, and tells Jeroboam he will be punished, and his line will be cut off. It is in chapter 15. The dynasties in Israel are pretty short, and the end is always gruesome. Meanwhile, Israel and Judah are warring back and forth with very little movement of the border. Eventually, after several pathetic and short-lived kings and one civil war within a civil war, a strong king takes power in Israel named Omri. We don't know very much about him, apart from he was a jerk like the rest of them, but his son is pretty important, Ahab. Now is a good time to get a taste of the usual formula for a king's reign in these books. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab the son of Omri began to reign over Israel, and Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. By political standards, things are actually going pretty well. There's a strong king with alliances to other strong kings nearby. He's not threatened by his neighbors from the north or the south. Soon his southern counterpart will be asking to make an alliance, too. But politics isn't the arena that matters, is it? Morally, religiously, spiritually, this is a disaster. And what exactly is the benefit of having a stable political order and a flourishing economy 
when your society is mired in the cesspit of immorality, debauchery, paganism, and wickedness that leads only to sin and despair in this life and damnation in the next. Wait, are we still talking about ancient Israel? Maybe I'll just let you chew on that one. Into the festering swamp, God sends a heretofore unheard of prophet. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And that's what happened. There are several tales of Elijah's exploits in a row over the next several chapters, leading to an interesting scenario in which Ahab, the evil, immoral, powerful king that Elijah has been rebuking, hangs out with Elijah after Elijah humiliates and kills a massive number of prophets whose chief patron was Ahab. It's not as if Ahab has grown to like Elijah or anything, but he respects him now. Ahab's wife, on the other hand, never really comes to that point. Chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba. This is also a great story, but we've got to move on for the sake of time. Eventually, Ahab repents of his sin, somewhat, but he still approaches his job as if God's word doesn't matter and probably isn't even real. Another prophet tells him that he will get himself killed if he attacks a Syrian town. Ahab attacks the Syrian town anyway, and he guesses how it turns out. Well, that brings us to 2 Kings pretty soon afterward. The pattern is still the same, and the main character is still Elijah, at least briefly. In chapter 2, God takes him to heaven and leaves his protege, Elisha. Elisha also has a surprisingly close relationship to the king he's always rebuking. There's a series of short stories about some of Elisha's miracles. The stories of Elisha are less focused than Elijah's. Elijah seemed to be, like, driving at a coherent purpose. Turn the kings, and by extension the people, back to serving God. And it's not that Elisha isn't working towards something similar, but it seems like the status quo was more accepted during his tenure. But don't get the idea that Elisha was a squish. Elisha has been on fairly good terms with the king of Israel, Joram. He accompanies him on military campaigns. He bails him out of a budding international incident with a Syrian military official. He inhabits the same besieged city as the king and promises deliverance. His friends get special treatment from King Joram on the grounds of their relationship to Elisha. But he sends a young prophet on a mission in 2 Kings chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. So he arose and went into the house, and the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel, and you shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants the prophets and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. Elisha has sent a young prophet on a mission to instruct Jehu, the guy that's been anointed here, to kill Joram and rule in his place. Joram, the, the guy that Elisha spends a lot of time hanging out with. Does that seem cold? Well, that's what God decreed. Take it up with him. He's the judge. That's actually the last we hear of Elisha for a while, and then we shift back to the political history. I've mostly skated past events in Judah, because Kings just doesn't talk very much about them. But there's an important detail that bears fleshing out uh, at this point about Ahab's southern counterpart, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat made peace with Ahab and secured the alliance by taking the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, Athaliah, as wife for his son, Joram. If you're thinking, wait, wasn't Joram the king of Israel? Yes, Ahab apparently named his son after Joram. So the elder Joram, by the way, returned the favor and named his son and heir after Ahaziah. So that's confusing. This means that there is an Ahaziah king of Israel, followed by a Joram king of Israel, and at roughly the same time, a Joram king of Judah, followed by Ahaziah king of Judah. Both are descended from Ahab because of the marriage alliance with Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah, being given to the son of Jehoshaphat. And what was Jehu told to do again? Chapter 9, verse 21. Joram said, Make ready, and they made ready his chariot. Then Joram king of Israel and Ahaziah king of Judah set out, each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu, and met him at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? 
He answered, What peace can there be, so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Then Joram reigned about and fled, saying to Ahaziah, Treachery, O Ahaziah! And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulders, so that the arrow pierced his heart, and he sank in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar his aide, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father, how the Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. Now therefore take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. When Ahaziah the king of Judah saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagan, and Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot at the ascent of Gur, which is by Ibleam. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. His servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his fathers in the city of David. Yikes! Well, that was violent and gruesome and unsavory and also decreed by God. Jehu is doing exactly what he's supposed to do. He's the closest Israel comes, actually, to having a good king. But it doesn't last. Chapter 10, verse 31. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. Meanwhile, things have gone crazy in Judah with Jezebel's daughter Athaliah murdering her own children and grandchildren in order to put herself on the throne instead of them. This lasts for six or seven years until the one grandchild she missed is old enough to be installed on the throne, the child king Joash. From this point, it's basically back to the pattern of bickering back and forth between the north and the south, and idol worship in the north, and slightly less idol worship in the south, and decades passing with only a few words to summarize their events. Israel descends into greater and greater chaos with the dynasty changing with great frequency and much gore. While they're fighting amongst themselves, Assyria is quietly becoming the dominant force in the region and building a massive empire based on conquest and subjugation. That brings us to 2 Kings 17, verse 1. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea the son of Elah began to reign in Samaria over Israel, and he reigned nine years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria, and for three years he besieged it. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria, and placed them in Hala, and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. Oops. You can see Hoshea's political miscalculations, but that's not the whole story. Why did this happen, really? Continue in verse 7. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. Long story short, it was a big, nasty mess. But at least there's still Judah, right? Eh, verse 19. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. I suppose this is as good a time as any to take a step back and remember that this is recorded for our good. As Paul says in Romans 15, 4, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So what good does this do for us? How are we supposed to have hope because of this? Well, it serves as a pretty stark warning, doesn't it? Now, do I mean that if America doesn't get right, God will send the chai Coms to conquer and enslave us? No, not really. That could happen, regardless of whether our country makes a concerted effort to please God or not. But that's not really the point. Human flourishing is nice and all. It's a gift from God. But we're not living under the Mosaic Covenant. There's a new king, Jesus, and his kingdom is not of this world. There's a sense in which calamities may be divine judgments, but also... God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. But the divine judgment that should concern us most is likewise not of this world. What happened to God's people in the 8th century BC should be a spiritual warning more than a physical one. Since Israel is no more, the final eight chapters of 2 Kings follow Judah's last golden age and decline into a similar fall to a similarly brutal conqueror in Babylon. 
Let's try to enjoy the good times briefly first. Chapter 18. In the third year of Hoshea son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was twenty-five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty-nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi the son of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. Great! He faces difficulties and persecution and times when it looks like Assyria is sure to conquer him anyway, but he puts his faith in God, he refuses to go along with it, and he sees God save his people and his kingdom. Now his son Manasseh is pretty terrible, but his great-grandson Josiah is much like Hezekiah. Chapter 22, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. There's too much for us to read about Josiah, but he goes to great lengths to stamp out idol worship in Judah and even in Samaria, which isn't technically his territory, but it is part of Israel's ancestral homeland. He brings the law back. He teaches it to the people. He does his best to live by the law. And then he dies in battle, after which his kingdom ping-pongs between Egyptian and Babylonian spheres of influence for a couple of generations before crumbling pathetically. And that's basically how Second Kings ends. There's no summarization or conclusion. There's no goal reached. There are no lessons learned or taught. Just one moment there's more of the story to tell, and the next there isn't. I suppose that abrupt cutoff is fitting, considering how it must have felt for Judah. It's not as if God hadn't warned them. He told them in Leviticus 26 that this was going to happen if they rebelled. He told them again in Deuteronomy 28-32 through that this was going to happen if they rebelled. He told Solomon at the dedication of the temple that this was going to happen if they rebelled. He told them through prophets like Elijah and Elisha. Somehow, they still managed to be surprised. But are we all that different? How many times does God have to tell us? How many years do we have to live in possession of his word before we heed the warning? Don't make Israel's mistake. Don't make Judah's mistake. Instead, follow the example set by the righteous through the ages, men like Elijah and Elisha and Joash and Hezekiah and Josiah. Now, all of those men committed their own sins, and we know about some of them in detail. Learn from their mistakes, certainly, and imitate their successes. Imitate their faith. Imitate their obedience. If you need help with this, we'd love to provide it at River Ridge. You can get in touch with us by phone at 812-550-6234 or send us an email at info at riverridgechurch.org. You can also find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. We gather at 9 a.m. every Sunday for Bible study, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. for worship, and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays for another study. I'd love to see you there. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.